Um, so I hope you enjoyed um, last week's tutorial on TensorFlow. And uh, this week, uh, we again have something very special for you. Simon Osendero here uh, will give a lecture about newer networks, backpropagation, how to train those networks, and so on. And um, it's really quite special to have Simon here. He really is an expert on the topic. He also works at DeepMind in the Deep Learning Group. Um, he is educated locally, uh, to some degree at least, yeah, right? Yeah. So, uh, UCL alma mater. <laughs> uh, Cambridge, then uh, PhD at UCL, mm -hmm. and then later worked with uh, Jeff Hinton um, in Canada. So there couldn't be a better person uh, to do this. Before we start, uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, Terry Williams, who attended here last week, he's running a, a reading group on deep learning and the game of Go. I'll put uh, this book cover and his uh, card here on the table in case anyone's interested. It's basically a new book that came out uh, that tries to um, explain deep learning based on, uh, on the game of Go um, in the wake of AlphaGo. Okay, thank you very much. Over cool. to you, Simon. Cool. Thank you, Tor. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's see. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, you can hear me okay at the back? Cool. So. Yes, yeah, so um, as I was saying, today's lecture is just going to be covering some of the foundations of neural networks. And I'm guessing that some of you will be quite familiar with uh, the material that we're going to go over today. And I hope that most of you have seen bits of it before. But nevertheless, it's kind of good to go back over the foundations to make sure that they're very solid. And also, one of the things that I'm going to hope to do as we go through is, in addition to kind of conveying some of the mathematics, also try and give you a sense of the intuition to get a kind of deeper and more visceral understanding of, of what's going on. Um, and as we go through, there'll be a couple of, sort of natural section breaks between the sections. So um, that's probably a good time to do questions from the preceding section if there are any. And we'll also have an in-seat break in the middle, um, probably about 2 thirds of the way through. And then the, the last point is um, these slides are all going to be available online. And in the slides, I've added uh, quite a few hyperlinks out to additional material, which if one of the topics we're talking about is particularly interesting to you, you can kind of go off and, and read more about that. OK, and so this slide is, um, in some sense, a, a TLDR of what we're going to do today. And um, at a high level, it's also kind of a TLDR of what we're going to do in this entire course. So deep learning and neural networks is actually pretty simple. It's, it's more or less just the composition of linear transforms and nonlinear functions. And it turns out that by composing these quite simple building blocks into large graphs, we gain sort of massive, uh, powerful, flexing, flexible modeling power. And when I, when I say massive, I, I do mean quite massive. So these days, we routinely train neural networks with hundreds of millions of parameters. And when I say training or learning, what does that mean? Well, it basically just means optimizing a loss function that in some sense describes the problem we're interested in over some data set or in the case of reinforcement learning uh, with respect to world experience with, um, with respect to our parameters. And we do that using various gradient um, optimization methods. Uh, one of the most common of those is SGD or stochastic gradient descent. And so from 1,000 feet, that's, that's kind of it. it it's, it's pretty simple. But in this course, what we're going to do is look at the details of the different building blocks, when you might want to make certain choices, and also how to do this well at a, a very large scale. So before we dive in, let's step back a little bit and ask, why are we doing this? What, what are neural nets good for? And it turns out they're actually useful for a whole ton of things. In fact, these days, you know, I, I think a better question is, you know, if you can come up with the right loss function and acquire training data, what are neural nets not good for? Um, so just to kind of go over some examples, in recent years, we've seen some very impressive steps forward in computer vision. We can now recognize objects and images with very high accuracy. There's all sorts of cool, um, more esoteric applications that, that folks can do. So there's some very nice work looking at doing superhuman um, recognition of human emotions by um, having a neural network that can recognize micro expressions on folks' faces. So um, essentially better at reading human emotions than, than humans are. Um, later in this course, there'll be a module on sequence models with re recurrent neural networks. And there we've seen incredible gains in speech recognition. Um, one of the cool things, again, in recent years that, that came up 
is um, this idea of using neural networks for machine translation. And furthermore, uh, it turns out that you can use neural networks for multilingual machine translation. So the oh. Uh, is, is, hello? Um, hello? Actually, I don't know if the, maybe the mic's on, turn on. I'll, I'll try and raise my voice, but uh, yeah, please do raise your hand if, uh, if you're having trouble hearing me. Um, yeah, so one of the uh, particularly cool uh, things that came out in the last year or so is this idea of doing multilingual translation through a common representation. So we can translate from many languages into many other languages. Um, can you hear me? Ah, cool. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Heavily wired. OK. Um, is that better for folks? Great. Um, yeah, this, this notion of a kind of interlingua. So if we have a common representation space that is the bottleneck when we're translating from one language to another, then in a very real sense, you can think of the representations in that space as some kind of interlingua. So it's kind of representing concepts across many different languages. Um, along some lines, there's been some excellent work from DeepMind on speech synthesis. So going from um, text to speech. And uh, WaveNet was um, something that was developed at DeepMind starting about two years ago, and now it's in production. So a lot of the voices that you'll hear in, say, Google Home or Google Assistant are now synthesized with WaveNet. So a very fast turnaround from research to large-scale deployment. Uh, other places where they've been enjoying um, impressive uses in reinforcement learning, and you'll hear much more about that in the other half of the course. So things like DQN or A3C, um, and applying that to game settings like Atari, and then also moving into um, more realistic games in 3D environments. Also, with reinforcement learning, you guys are all probably familiar with AlphaGo, um, which uh, was able to beat the, the human world champion at Go, and has now even superseded that by playing just the games itself, so not, not even using any, any human data now. Uh, the list goes on. And in all these cases, what we're dealing with is pretty simple, and there's uh, just a couple of different elements. Let me see if I can grab a laser pointer. There you go. Cool. Yeah, so we essentially have our neural network, so we define some architecture. We have our inputs, so it could be images, spectrograms, you name it. We have um, parameters that define the network and some outputs that we want to predict. And essentially all we're doing is formulating a loss function between our inputs and our outputs, and then optimizing that loss function with respect to our parameters. And, and, and again, it's at a high level, um, everything we're doing is very simple, but the, the devil is in the details. So here's a, a roadmap for most of the rest of today. Um, so the, the, the field of neural networks has been around for a, a long time, and there's a fairly rich history. So there's you know, not time to cover all that today. What we're, we are going to cover today in, in, in the course overall are the things that are having the most impact right now. But I just wanted to begin by calling out some of the topics that I think are interesting, but that we're not going to cover. Um, and I'd also encourage you to kind of delve into the history of the field if there are particular topics that you're interested in, because there's a lot of work dating back to the sort of like early 2000s and even the 80s and 90s that is probably worth revisiting. Um, in the rest of the course, we'll begin by um, a treatment of single layer networks and just seeing, OK, what can we do with just um, one layer of weights and, and neurons? We'll then move on to talk about the advantages that we get by adding just one hidden layer. Um, and then we'll kind of switch gears and kind of focus on what I call modern deep nets. So here it's um, useful just to think in terms of abstract compute graphs. Um, and we'll see some very large um, networks and also how to think about composing those in software. Um, there'll be a section, and this is probably the, the most math heavy part of today on learning. And so there we'll kind of recap some concepts from calculus um, and back to algebra, and then we'll talk about modular backprop and automatic differentiation, and those are tools that allow us to build these extremely esoteric graphs without having to think too much about how learning operates. Um, I'll talk a bit about what I'm calling a model zoo, so um, when we think about these networks in terms of these modules, then what are the building blocks that we can use to construct them from? And then towards the end, um, 
I'll touch on some kind of practical topics in terms of, you know, when you're actually doing this in practice, what are things that you might want to be aware of? What are tricks you can use to sort of diagnose if things are going wrong? And maybe we'll talk about a, a research topic. Um, yes, yeah, so as I was saying, it's, it's a large field with many branches. Um, dating back, depending when you count, dating back to the 60s, and then there was another resurgence in the 80s. So a couple of things that I think are interesting that won't be covered in this lecture course are bolts and machines and hot field networks. They were developed um, um, th through the 80s and for quite a while were, were extremely popular. And um, there was some interesting early work, I guess, in the, the second wave of neural networks. That they're not in favor as much now, but um, I think they're still useful. So particularly for situations where we're interested in models of memory and in, in particular associative memory. Um, so I think f for me, that's, that's one thing that's worth revisiting. Another area that um, was popular at one time that and doesn't receive as much attention now is uh, models that operate in the continuous time domain, so in particular spiking neural networks. And one of the reasons that they're interesting, that it's, it's a, a different learning paradigm, but um, if you have that kind of model, it's possible to do extremely efficient implementations in hardware, so you can have um, very low power um, neural, neural networks. Um, so as I said, yeah. There's, there's lots of things to, to look at, so I'd encourage you to look at the history of the field in addition to the stuff that we, we cover in this course. Um, oh, and w one last thing um, at a high level, there's a small caveat on terminology. Um, and this is a little bit a function of the, the history of the field. Uh, we sometimes use different names to refer to the same thing. So, um, I'll try and be consistent, but um, I'm sure I won't manage it fully. So for instance, um, people interchangeably might use the word unit or neuron to describe um, the acti activity in a single element of a layer. Um, similarly, um, you might hear nonlinearity or activation function, and they, they also mean the same thing. Um, slightly trickier is that um, we sometimes use the same name to refer to different things. So um, in the more traditional view of the field, folks would refer to the compound of, say, a nonlinear transformation plus a nonlinearity as a layer. Um, in more modern parlance, particularly when we're thinking about implementation of things like TensorFlow, then we kind of tend to um, describe as a layer these more atomic operations. So in, in this case, we'd call the linear transformation as one layer and the uh, nonlinearity another layer. And linked to that, there's also slightly different graphical conventions um, when we're depicting models. It should usually be obvious from context, but I just wanted to call that out just in case that's confusing. Um, okay, so as I said, we're gonna start off with what can we do with single layer networks? And to begin with, I'm gonna make a very short digression on real neurons and um, describe some of the kind of inspiration for the artificial neurons we, we use. It's a very loose connection and I won't dwell there too much. Um, we'll then talk about what we can do with a linear layer um, sigmoid activation function, and then we'll kind of recap um, binary classification or, or logistic regression, which should have been in either the last lecture or in the revision notes for that le lecture. Um, and then we'll move on from binary classification into multi-class classification. Okay, so in the slide here um, in the bottom right, this is a, um, a cartoon depiction of a, a real neuron. So there's a couple of things going on. We have a cell body. Um, the dendrites, which is where the inputs from other neurons are received, and then the axon um, with the terminal bulbs, and that's kind of the outputs from this neuron. And more or less the way this operates, when a neuron is active, an electrical impulse travels down the axon. It reaches the terminal bulb, which causes vesicles of neurotransmitter to be released. Those kind of diffuse across the gap between um, this neuron and the neuron that it's communicating with. Um, when it's received in the dendrites, it causes a, a depolarization that eventually makes its way back to the cell body. And the sort of sum of the depolarizations from all these dendrites is what determines whether or not the receiving neuron is going to fire or not. Um, <clears throat> and in a very, very coarse way, this process of receiving inputs um, of different strengths and integrating it in the cell body is what um, this equation is describing. So it's just a weighted sum of inputs, or an affine transformation, if you will. So the inputs x, the, the weights um, w, and maybe some bias b. And so this is what we'd call a simple linear neuron. Um, 
Um, if we have a whole collection of them, then we can move into matrix vector notation. So this uh, vector y is a, ve a vector of linear neuron states, and we obtain that by um, doing a matrix vector multiplication between the inputs and our weight matrix and some bias vector b. And um, there's not an awful lot we can do with that, that setup, but we are able to do linear regression, which um, I think you guys saw previously. But in practice, we, we typically combine these linear layers with some nonlinearity, and particularly if we're stacking them in depth. So let's, um, let's take a look at one of those nonlinearities, and this will kind of complete the picture of our artificial neuron. So um, what I'm showing here is something called the sigmoid function. Um, you can think of it as a kind of squashing function. So um, this equation here describes the input-output relationship. And so when we combine that with the, the linear mapping from previously, we have a weighted sum of inputs offset by a bias, and then we pass it through this squashing function. And this, in a very coarse way, um, reproduces what happens in a, in a real neuron when it receives inputs. So there's some threshold uh, below which um, the neuron isn't going to fire at all. Once it's above threshold, then it um, increases its firing rate, but there's only so fast that a real neuron can fire, and so it ends up saturating. And so um, at a very high level, that's what this function is is performing for us. Um, it used to be that this was um, the sort of canonical choice in neural networks. So if you look at papers, particularly from the, the 90s or the early 2000s, you'll see um, this kind of activation function everywhere. It's not that common anymore, um, and we'll go into some of the reasons why, but at a high level, it doesn't have as um, nice gradient properties as we'd like when we're building these very deep models. However, it is um, still actively used in a couple of places, so in particular, uh, for gating units if we want to um, kind of have some kind of soft differentiable switch. And one of the most common places that you'll see this is in long short-term memory cells, um, which you'll hear a lot more about in the class on recurrent networks. Um, so yeah, as I said, even with just a, a simple linear um, plus sigma neuron, we can actually do useful things. So um, I just grabbed, um, this purple box here, I, I grew up on Torah slides, so there's a slight change in notation. But <clears throat> if you think back to logistic regression, what do we have? We have a linear model, um, a link function, and then a cross entropy loss. And this linear model is exactly what's going on um, in this linear layer. And the link function um, is what the sigmoid is doing. So there's an extremely tight relationship between um, logistic regression and binding classification. and um, these layers in a, in a neural network. And so with just a single neuron, we can actually uh, build a binary classifier. So in this toy example, I've got two classes, zero and one. If I arrange to have my weight vector pointing in this direction, so orthogonal to this red separating plane, um, and I adjust the strength of the weights and the biases appropriately, then I can have a system where when I give it an input from class zero, the output is zero. And when I give it an input from class one, the output is one. Um, so that was binary classification. We're now going to move on and discuss something called uh, a softmax layer. And this essentially extends binary classification into multi-class classification. So uh, this type of layer is a way to allow us to do either multi-class classification. Another place that you, you might see this used is um, internally in networks if you need to do some kind of multi-way switching. So if, say, you have a junction in your network and there's multiple different inputs, and um, one of them needs to be rooted. Uh, this is something you can use as a kind of multi-way gating mechanism. So um, what does it actually do? Well, if we first think about the argmax function, uh, so when we apply that to some input vector x, all but the largest element is 0, and the largest element is 1. The softmax is essentially just a soft version of the argmax. So rather than only the largest element being one and everything else being zero. The largest element will be the one that's closest to one, the others will be close to zero, and the sum of activities across the output vector will be one. So it, it also gives us a probability distribution. Um, the mathematical form is here, so we have these exponents, and um, I don't know if the resolution is high enough on this monitor, but what I'm showing in these two bar plots here is two slightly different scenarios. So. The red bars are the inputs, the blue bars are the outputs, and 
the scale of the red bars in the in the lower plot is double that of the one in the uh, the upper plot. So, um, in this example here, the the output for the <coughs> largest input is the largest, and um, you can't quite see, but it's about 0.6, so the closest to one. However, if I increase the magnitude of all the inputs so that the ratios are still the same, but now this is 0.9, so it's much, much closer to one. So as the scale of the inputs gets larger and larger, this gets closer and closer to doing a hard max operation. Um, and so what can we use this for? Well, as I said, we can use it to do um, multi-way classification. So if we combine this kind of uh, unit with a cross entropy loss, we're able to train something that will do classification of inputs into one of several different classes. So let's take a look at what this relationship looks like. So the output for the ith element, which you can think of as the probability that the input is assigned to class i, is given by, um, in the numerator, we have an exponent that is a weighted sum of inputs plus a, uh, a bias. And then this is normalized by that same expression over all the other possible outputs. So we have a probability distribution. And in a sense, you can think of what's going on in this exponent as being the amount of evidence that we have for the presence of the ith class. Um, and how do, we, how do we train this? How do we learn? Um, we can just do that by minimizing the negative log likelihood, or equivalently, the cross entropy of the true labels under our predictive distribution. <coughs> in terms of notation, how we represent that, something that you commonly see are these things called one-hot vectors um, to encode the true class label. And what does that look like? Well, basically, it's a vector that is of the um, dimensionality of the output space. The elements for the true class, the, the entry for the element of the true class label is one, and everything else is zero. So it's uh, this vector here in, in the example with these digits. So for digit four, the one hot label vector would look like this. So the fourth element is one, everything else is zero. Um, if we plug this into our expression for the negative log likelihood, then we see something like this. So since the only element that, um, of t that is going to be non-zero is the target, we're essentially asking this probability here, um, the log probability of this, to be maximized. And then we just sum that across our data cases. So um, even just with a, a linear layer, if we were to optimize this, we could form a very simple linear multi-way classifier for, say, digits. Um, it wouldn't work super well, and we'll, we'll talk about adding depth, but um, that, that's something that you can actually usefully do with one of these layers. Um, now, as I said, it's, it used to be the case that the, the sigmoid was the, the dominant nonlinearity. Um, that's fallen out of favor, and so in a lot of the neural networks that you'll see nowadays, a much more common activation function is something called the rectified linear unit, or sometimes it's just shortened to ReLU. And it has a couple of nice properties. So it's a lot simpler and computationally cheaper than the sigmoid. It's basically a, a function that thresholds um, below by zero or otherwise has a pass-through. So um, we can write it down as this. So if the, if the input to the ReLU function is below zero, then the output is just zero. And then above zero, it's just a linear pass-through. Um, and it has a couple of nice properties, one of which is um, in this region here, um, the gradient is constant. Um, and, and generally, in, in neural networks, we, we want to have gradients flowing. So it's maybe not so nice here that there's no gradient information here. But at least once it's active, the gradient is constant. And we don't have any saturation regions once, once the, the unit is active. So you'll, you'll hear, I think, a lot more about the details of um, the gradient properties of this kind of stuff in James Martin's lecture later on in optimization. But um, these are kind of some of the subtleties that I was talking about that are important to think about. Um, OK, so we've, we've now seen just a very basic single layer. Now let's move on one step and ask, OK, what can we do if we have um, more than one layer? So what can we do with uh, neural networks with a hidden layer? Um, and to motivate this, we'll take a look at um, a very simple example. So what happens if we want to do binary classification, but the inputs are not linearly separable? Um, and then in the second part of this section, um, I'll kind of give a, a visual proof for why we can see that neural networks are universal pro function approximators. So with, enough, with a large enough network, we can approximate any function. Um, 
So when I say uh, uh, a single hidden layer, this is what I mean. So we have some inputs here, um, a linear module um, of weights, um, some nonlinear activations to give us this hidden representation, another linear mapping, and then either directly to the outputs or some output nonlinearity. And basically, another way of thinking about why this is useful is that the outputs of one layer are the inputs to the next, and so it allows us to transform our input through a series of intermediate representations. And the hope is that rather than trying to solve the problem we're interested in directly in input space, we can find this series of transformations that render our problem simpler in some transform representation. So um, again, I think this was um, covered towards the end of Thor's previous lecture, but if you think back to what's going on with basis functions, it's a similar kind of idea. So this is um, probably the, the simplest example that can exemplify that. So it's um, kind of simple XOR task. So let's imagine that I have four data points living in 2D, A, B, C, and D. And A and B are members of class 0. C and D are members of class 1. Now, if I just have a um, single linear layer plus logistic, there's no way that I can correctly classify these points. There's no, there's no line I can draw that will put um, the, yellow, the, the yellow points on one side and the blue points on the other. Now let's think about what we can do with a, a very simple network um, as I've drawn here. So we're just going to have two hidden units. Um, and so let's imagine that the, the first hidden unit um, has a weight vector pointing in this direction. So um, in terms of the, its outputs, these will be 0 in this red shaded region and 1 here. And then the second hidden unit will have a slightly different decision boundary. It'll be this one. So it'll be 0 here and 1 here. Uh, and now if we ask ourselves, OK, in this space of hidden activities, if I re-represent the data, if I, if I plot it again, which I'm doing down here, what does my classification problem like in this new space? So uh, let's go through the steps of that. So um, point A had uh, 1 for the first hidden unit and 0 for the second. So it would live here. Point B. Same again, 1 and 0 also lives there. Point C has 0 for the first hidden unit, 0 for the second. It lives here. And then D um, has 1 and 1, so it lives here. So this is the representation of these four data points in the input space. This is the representation in this, um, this first hidden layer. And so in this space, the two classes now are linearly separable. And so if I add an additional uh, linear plus sigmoid on top of this, then I'm able to classify these two point, the, um, this data set correctly. And so this is, um, again, it's a very simple example, but I think it's a useful motivation for why um, having a hidden layer gives us additional power. Um, actually, it looks like there's a couple of seats for you. I see um, a couple of folks standing at the back if you want to take a second to sit down, if, if that's easy for you. There's uh, a couple down here at the front and in the second row. Um, so here's uh, another problem of a similar flavor, but slightly less trivial. So if we now have um, the setting here where the data from different classes live in these quadrants, then just two hidden units on their own won't cut it. But it turns out that with six hidden units, you can actually do a pretty good job at carving up this input space into the four quadrants. And um, there's a link from the slide out. It's something that if, if you guys are not aware of, it's, uh, it's nice to look at. There's a, a TensorFlow web playground that basically lets you take some of these very simple problems in your browser and play around with different numbers of units, different nonlinearities, and so on. And it sort of will typically train on these problems in, in a few seconds. And it's, um, e even though it's very simple, I think it's a really nice thing to look at to refine your intuition for. Um, what sorts of things these models learn, what the decision boundaries look like, uh, and to kind of you know, add um, detail to your kind of mental picture of what's going on. So um, yeah, when the slides are shared, I'd encourage you to, to, to take a look at that and just kind of play with some of these simple problems in the browser to kind of refine your intuition. Um, OK, so we've seen the, the power that we can get for these toy problems. Um, I'm now going to go through, um, I guess I'd call it a sort of it's not quite a proof, but a, a visual intuition pump, if you will, for um, why 
neural networks with just one hidden layer can still be viewed as universal function approximators. And this is one of those ideas that was arrived at by several people more or less uh, concurrently. Um, one of the kind of well-known sort of, uh, proposers of a proof of this was uh, a guy, Chibenko, um, from 89, um, and the, the paper's linked here. There's also, again, in terms of the hyperlinks, there's, again, some nice interactive um, web demos, um, one of them in, in Michael Nielsen's uh, web book on deep learning that um, I'd recommend you, you take a look at. And um, going a little beyond the scope of this class, it turns out that um, there are interesting links uh, along these lines to be made between neural networks and something called Gaussian processes. Um, th they're not going to be covered um, today, but um, again, I'd encourage you to take a look if you're interested. Okay, so what, what is our, our visual proof going to be that with enough hidden units, we can use a, a neural network to approximate anything. So let's begin by just considering two of our linear plus sigmoid units here. And uh, let's imagine that we arrange for the weight vectors to point in the same direction, or um, maybe we'll start off with just a scalar case. So the only difference between unit one and unit two is the bias. So that's the kind of offset of where the sigmoid kicks in. And then let's imagine, OK, what happens if we take this pair of units and we, um, we subtract them from each other? Um, what does that um, difference output look like? And it turns out it looks something a little like this, this kind of bump of activity. Why? Well, over to the far left, both these units are 0. So the, the difference is 0. Over to the far right, the output from both these units is 1. So they cancel. And then in the middle, we have this, this little bump. And so by having this pair of units, we're able to create this, this bump here, which is a lot like a basis function, right? So let's imagine that we want to use our neural network with a hidden layer to model this gray, this arbitrary gray function here. One of the ways we could do it, it's probably not the best way, but just as a kind of proof to show it can be done, is you could imagine now that I've got these um, little bumps of activity, I can arrange for their offset to lie at different points along this line, and I can also scale the, um, put a multiplicative scale on this. So the idea is through pairs of units, we can kind of come up with these little bumps. And if we think of what the sum of all these bumps look like, if I have enough of them and they're narrow enough, then it starts to look um, like this gray curve that we're trying to fit. So the more bumps we have, i.e. The, the bigger the, the hidden layer, the more accurate our approximation. And so that's the kind of a sketch proof for 1D. In 2D, the same sorts of ideas apply, except uh, we now need a pair of um, hidden units for each dimension of the input. So um, it's hard to visualize in dimensions beyond two, but um, a similar sort of thing would apply in 2D, where we, if we have four neurons, we can build these little towers of activity that we can kind of shift around. And again, the, the same idea would apply. So um, yeah, hopefully the, the, this has convinced you that with enough units, we can approximate everything, although it doesn't sound very efficient, and you'd hope that there's a much better way of doing that, and it, it turns out that there is. So um, now that we've seen what we can do, oh, question? If you add the, add the bumps up, as you said, mm -hmm. is that going to give the integral rather than the constant? Um, Um, mm, I don't think so. Um, the bottom picture. You're, you're not taking the area under each bump. You're just taking the kind of magnitude of the function. So um, is, did, did that answer your question? I think I may have misunderstood your question. No, I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, actually, any, any more questions before we move on? Okay. So <clears throat> now we're going to um, start to think about uh, deeper networks. So we've seen what we can do with just a single hidden layer. Um, and we, we do have this universal approximation property, but we've also seen that it's, it's kind of a horrible way to do it. It needs many, many units. And it turns out that as we add depth, um, 
things get a lot more powerful and we become a lot more efficient. And again, I'll, I'll give a kind of a reference to a paper that has the full proof, but um, for the class, I'll try and give you a sort of more visual motivation for um, how you can see that, that that is something that happens. Um, and again, to kind of motivate what you, are, what you get if you allow these uh, very deep transformations, again, coming back to this idea of rather than trying to kind of go from inputs to outputs in one go, um, it allows us to potentially break it down into, into smaller steps. So, um, you know, a cartoon from Vision might be, rather than going straight from a vector of pixels into some kind of scene level analysis, maybe it's easier if in the first stage of transformation we can extract the edges, uh, oriented edges from an image. From those, you can start to think about composing those edges into, say, junctions and small um, shapes. From there into parts, and there into objects, and then there into, into full scenes. So breaking down these complicated computations into smaller chunks. In the, in the second half of the section, um, we'll kind of flip to this, um, what I'm calling a, a more modern compute graph perspective. Um, and there we'll kind of really start to see the creative designs that you, you can do in these, in these very large networks. And I'll also throw in just a couple of examples of real world networks so that you can see what I mean when I, when I say that um, the structure of these things can get very elaborate. Okay, so um, yeah, what I'm going to do for this slide and the next one is just um, go over how we can see the benefits of depth. Um, you can ignore uh, this. Um, these are my slides from last year when there was an exam, but this year everything's coursework based, so you don't even need to worry. <laughs> um, so um, here, here's the construction. So if we imagine taking the rectified linear unit that we, we saw uh, previously, so um, one of these is just zero if it's, um, if, if the input is below zero, um, it's zero, it's linear above that. And imagine we take another one of these uh, rectifiers and essentially flip the signs of the weights and biases, so it's kind of the inverse. Um, what this gives us um, oriented around the, the origin in this case is a full rectifier. Um, and so in 1D, this has the property that anything we build on top of this will have the same output for a point at plus x as it will at minus x. So it's kind of, it's, it's mirroring, or you can imagine it as kind of um, folding the space over. Um, so yeah, multiple points in the input map to the same point in the output. And so this lets us have um, multiple regions of the input sharing the same functional mapping. Um, we'll kind of extend that from 1D into 2D here. So imagine that I have two pairs of these full rectifiers, so that would constitute um, four hidden units in this layer in total. Um, one of the rectifiers is arranged along the x-axis and one along the y-axis. And so what it means is that any, any function um, of the output of these is replicated in each of these quadrants. And so one way you can think about what these rectifiers are doing is if I were to take that 2D plane and kind of fold it over and then fold it back on itself, um, functions that I, I would map on that folded representation, if I unfold it, it kind of fold back into the, the original input space. So that's the kind of underlying intuition. Um, can you guys see that? Okay, yeah. Um, and so uh, this is from this paper from 2014 by uh, Montefar, Pascanu, Cho, and Benjo. And um, what I just described is the sort of basic operation they use to come up with this interesting proof about the representational power of deep networks. So um, I'll kind of step through this, this diagram fairly quickly. Again, if, you, if you're interested, then it's, it's a nice paper and, and fairly easy to read, but it, it's just um, too, too many details to go through today. So. Um, as I said, we imagine by applying these pairs of rectifiers, what you end up with is this folded space. I can, um, on, the, on the outputs of that, so I can apply a new set of um, units on top of that, which would end up kind of folding the space again. Um, and so what we end up with, any decision bound we have in the final layer, as we kind of backtrack, so go th going through this unfolding, gets replicated um, or distributed to different parts of the input space. So um, probably the, the most helpful thing to look at is this, this figure here. So if we have uh, a network arranged like this, 
if, in this output layer, if we have a linear decision boundary, when we unfold that, um, we end up with four, um, four boundaries, one in each of the quadrant, um, represented here. So we've gone from two regions that we can separate here to eight regions that we can separate here. If we were to unfold that again, um, then we end up with 32 regions. So the kind of the high level take home from this is that the number of uh, regions that we can assign different labels to uh, increases exponentially with depth. Uh, and it turns out it only increases polynomially with the number of units per layer. So um, sort of all else being equal for a fixed total number of neurons, there's um, potentially much more power by making a narrow deep network than there is in having a shallow wide network. Um, you know, the, the details of that will depend on your problem, but that's one of the intuitions for why adding depth is so helpful. It's, uh, I just had a question. So through time, when they showed that the, the maximum expressivity scales much better with depth. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of evidence that in practice that extra expressivity is actually used? Um, <coughs> I guess. So it's hard to answer these questions. So I, I say the state of theory in deep learning at the moment is, is nowhere near where we'd like it to be. So um, there aren't sort of good rigorous demonstrations of that. Empirically, um, in a lot of problems, um, what you'll find is you know, if, you, if you try and tackle something with a fixed budget um, of units, then in practice, often you will get better empirical performance by adding a couple of hidden layers rather than having one very wide, uh, very wide one, but it's, it's also problem dependent. Um, yeah, I think there's another question somewhere over there. No, okay. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, maybe I can ask some more questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't worry if that <laughs> with my first, uh, yeah, I, I'd actually just encourage you to, to read the paper because it's, uh, it's, it's really nicely written, and to the extent that you know, this works for you as an intuition pump, um, it, it's worth taking the time to kind of go through the, the arguments and, and understand it. Um, OK, so now, um, as I said, we're going to switch gears a bit and move from this, uh, what I would say is a kind of more traditional style of um, depicting and thinking about neural networks, and in this we sort of bundle in uh, our description of layers, the nonlinearities, and move towards this kind of um, more explicit compute graph representation where we have separate nodes for our, our weights, and we separate out, separate out the linear transformation from the, uh, the nonlinearities. And this is more similar to the kind of thing that you'll see if you look at, say, visualizations in TensorBoard. So um, these are kind of isomorphic to each other. And um, to these equations here, I'm just, I just put together an, an arbitrary graph just to kind of highlight this. So uh, we have um, input to a first hidden layer with a sigmoid. Uh, the outputs of this go to a second hidden layer, which I decided to pick a, a ReLU for. Um, there's another pathway. So th yeah, this one is ReLU. There's another pathway uh, coming through here, and then they combine at the output. That, exactly the same thing here. I'm just kind of adding uh, um, these additional nodes. Um, and it, it seems like we, we've kind of made, th this one looks more complicated than this one, but the, there's a reason for kind of breaking it down like this, which we'll kind of move on to um, in the next sections. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the idea of kind of looking at these systems just as kind of um, compute graphs from modular building blocks. And the nice thing is, if we, if we represent and think about our models in this way, then there's a nice link into software implementation. So uh, we can kind of take a very object-oriented approach to composing these graphs and to implementing them. And for most of what we need to do, there's a very small, minimal set of API functions that each of these modules needs to be able to carry out. And you can basically have anything as a module in your graph as long as it can carry out these, um, these three functionalities. So uh, 
and we'll, we'll go through them uh, in, the, in the subsequent slides, but um, just to kind of uh, signpost them, there's a forward pass, so how do we go from inputs to outputs? There's a backwards pass, so given some gradients of the loss we care about, how do we um, uh, compute those gradients all the way through the graph? And then how do we compute um, the parameter updates? And this is just, um, putting this up here, this is what the compute graph for Inception v4 looks like. And I just wanted to kind of put this up there to ground why um, it's important to have this kind of modular framework because, you know, for the, for the small networks that I was showing you initially, it kind of doesn't matter how, how you set up your code. You, could, you, know, you can drive everything by hand. You, you know, maybe you want to fuse some of the operations yourself just to make things efficient. But once you have these massive, massive graphs, then keeping track of that in your head or by, by, by hand is just not really feasible. And so you need to have some automated way of plugging these things together and being able to, to deal with them. Um, so this, I think it's not state of the art anymore. That's a kind of you know, sign of how the field's moving. But as of around this time last year, this was a state of the art um, vision architecture. Um, it's, it's still pretty good. Uh, this is another example, uh, this time from uh, deep reinforcement learning. And again, I'm, I'm just kind of putting this up there to give you a sense of what sorts of architectures we end up using in real world problems and the sorts of um, somewhat arbitrary um, topologies that we can have depending on, on what we need to do. Um, the, the details of this um, don't matter too much, but I, I think towards the end of the RL course, Haddo might um, cover some of this stuff. Um, okay. So the, uh, the next section we're going to cover learning, and it's probably going to be one of the more math-heavy sections. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll cover the material, but um, I usually find it's not super productive to be very detailed with mathematics in a lecture, but uh, you can kind of refer to the slides for details afterwards. So what is, what is learning? As I said, it's, it's very simple. We have some loss function defined with respect to our data and model parameters. And then learning is just using optimization methods to find a set of model parameters that minimize this loss. And typically, we'll use some form of gradient descent to do this. And there'll be a whole lecture that kind of covers various ways of that optimization. Um, I guess something else that I'll add, just because um, it's starting to become uh, popular and it's also something that I'm working on in my research at the moment. So there are sort of gradient free ways of doing optimization. Um, so kind of zeroth order approximations to gradients or evolutionary methods. And again, it's, I, I guess one of those things where you know these things come in waves of fashion. They, they were kind of popular in the early 2000s. They've fallen out of favor. They're actually appearing again, um, particularly in some reinforcement learning contexts where you have the situation that Sure, we, we, we can kind of deal with gradients in our models, but um, depending on the data that we have available, so in, in reinforcement learning, the data you train on depends on how well you're exploring the environment. It might be that there just isn't a very good gradient signal there, and so um, we won't cover it today. I, I don't know if James will touch on it a bit on his lecture, but it's just useful to be aware of that there are these sort of gradient-free optimization methods as well, and depending on your problem, that might be something useful to think about and at least, at least be aware of. Um, so in this section, I'll start by doing a, a kind of a recap of some um, calculus and linear algebra. Uh, we'll recap uh, gradient descent, and then we'll talk about how to put these together on the compute graphs we were just discussing with automatic differentiation and something called modular backprop. And what I'll do at the end of the section is we can kind of go through um, a more detailed derivation of how we do a setup if we wanted to, say, do classification of MNIST digits with a network with one hidden layer. So just a kind of very trivial example, but once you've got that, it kind of generalizes to all sorts of other things that you'd want to do. <clears throat> so there's two concepts um, that it's useful to, to have in mind. They're kind of objects that allow us to write some of the, the equations more efficiently and to kind of think about these things in a slightly more compact way. So one of them is this notion of a gradient vector. So if I have some scalar function f of vector arguments, then the elements of the gradient vector, which is denoted here, um, with respect to x, um, are just the partial derivatives 
of the scalar output with respect to the individual dimensions of the vector. The other concept that's going to be useful in terms of writing some of these things down concisely me, is the uh, Jacobian matrix. And so there, if we have a vector function of vector arguments, then um, the Jacobian matrix, the n nth element of that is just the partial derivative of the nth element of the output vector with respect to the nth element of the input vector. And in terms of gradient descent, um, what does that mean? Well, uh, if we have some loss function that we want to minimize, then essentially we, we're just kind of repeatedly doing these updates where we take our previous parameter value, we compute the gradient, and we can do this either over our entire data set or um, which would be kind of batch or, or a kind of subset of the data, which would be mini batch or something that we end up calling online gradient descent, which is if we take one data point at a time. We just compute the gradient of our loss with respect to that data and then take a small step scaled by this learning rate eta in the direct descent direction and then we end up repeating this. Um, in what I'm going to talk about in the coming slides, I'm going to operate in the assumption that we're doing it online. Um, it doesn't change it much if we do uh, batch methods. It's just easier to represent if we just have one data case to think about. And um, I'll cover this a, a couple of times later as well, but it's just worth stressing that the choice of uh, learning rate, so the step size parameter, ends up making a big difference both to um, how quickly you can find solutions and, in fact, um, the quality of solutions that you end up finding. And so that's something that we'll touch on when we talk a bit about hyperparameter optimization. And moving beyond sort of simple gradient descent, there's a lot more sophisticated methods. So things like momentum, where you kind of keep around gradients from previous iterations and blend them with gradients from the current iteration. There's things like RMS prop or Adam, which are adaptive ways of um, scaling some of the step sizes along different directions. Um, and I think James is going to go into a lot more detail about that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, OK. So if we think back to kind of high school calculus, um, and in particular the chain rule. So let's start off with um, this uh, nested function. Um, so y is f of g of x. And so if we ask, OK, What's the um, derivative of y with respect to x? Well, we just plug in the chain rule. So it's the derivative of f with respect to g, considering g to be its argument, and then the derivative of g with respect to x. So simple ca scalar case, scalar output, scalar input. Uh, if we make this um, multivariate, so now let's imagine that our function f is a function of multiple arguments, each of which is a different function g1 through m of x. And again, we're interested in the same question. What's the, uh, the derivative of y with respect to x? Well, we sum over all these individual functions. And then for any one of them, uh, it's again just the chain rule from above. So the partial of f with respect to gi, and then the partial of gi with respect to x. So we basically. For each um, path of, of nesting, we take a product along a single path, and then we sum over all possible paths to get the, the total derivative. And we're basically just going to take these concepts and um, scale them up so that we can apply them to these compute graphs. And the only thing to be aware of, and I'll, I'll kind of mention this again in a second, there's a couple of efficiency tricks that we should be aware of. So if there are junctions as we traverse, there's opportunities to factorize these expressions. And that becomes particularly important if you have uh, a graph with a lot of uh, branching in its topology. Um, so let's, let's take um, our sort of arbitrary compute graph as an example again. So um, it's a little dense when I write it out, but um, hopefully this will kind of like carry over the point. So let's imagine we have some function mapping from x to y. And the way this is going to be composed, it's going to be some g of f. Um, f is going to be a function of um, its two inputs, e and j. And then 
e is this kind of nested sequence of fun functions or operations all the way to x, and similarly j. So if I um, take what, what I just set up here and ask, OK, what's the derivative of y with respect to x, then um, we take the product along um, these two paths, as I say, so a through g, and then there's also this path through here. And so we get these two expressions down here. Um, what I was saying about kind of some of the efficiency tricks is you'll notice there's some common terms towards the end of this expression and this expression. And so we could actually group these together, um, factor those out of, of that sum. Uh, in the scalar case, it doesn't matter too much. But when we move to the, the vector case and more elaborate graphs, you'll see why it's important. Essentially, if there's a lot of branching and joining, then we have to do these sums over the kind of combinatorially many paths through the graph um, for the mapping that we're interested in. Um, the other point that um, is, is worth mentioning is so if you look at the, the literature on automatic differentiation, uh, you might hear a couple of different terms. So there's something called forwards mode automatic differentiation and something called reverse mode automatic differentiation. And that just um, that's really referring to when we're computing uh, these expressions, do we compute the product starting from the input working towards the output, or do we work in reverse? And the difference um, between the two is to do with what sorts of intermediate properties that we, we end up with. Um, so if I work from the input towards the output, so um, if I'm computing the, this product, say, um, from the inputs to the outputs, then my intermediate terms are things like dA dx. Um, if I then compute this, then I basically um, would end up with dB dx, dC dx. So in forwards mode, we get the partial derivatives of the internal nodes with respect to the inputs, um, which is actually not super useful for what we want to do. It, it's great if you want to, say, do sensitivity analysis. So if I want to know how much changing a little bit of the input would affect the output. Um, this is exactly what we want to do. And um, that can be useful in deep learning if you want to get a sense of how models are representing functions, which bits of the input are important. But it's not useful for learning. However, if we traverse this in the opposite direction, so from outputs towards inputs, then we end up with um, terms that are derivatives of the output with respect to the internal nodes. And it turns out that that's exactly what we need for, for learning. So, um, so it's interesting kind of explaining this stuff, because on the one hand, it, it's all kind of trivial. It's, you know, it's basically the chain rule. Um, you know, you, you'll have seen this in, in high school. So it, it's kind of one of these simple ideas that um, actually had quite a big impact. So, even though it's kind of obvious when you look at it like this, in terms of the impact on efficiency when you're computing gradient updates for neural networks, it, it makes a big difference organizing the computation in this efficient way. And I think that's one of the reasons why when backprop was introduced, it had such a big impact, even though at, at heart it's a kind of fundamentally simple method. And also, we'll, we'll see as we move on to kind of the more vector calculus side of things, it all looks pretty trivial if we're dealing with uh, scalars, but once we move into uh, um, larger models, then the again we'll see see why the ordering makes a difference. So, uh, but yeah, it's essentially reverse mode automatic differentiation, a clever application of the chain rule, backprop, the, the all the same thing. So, uh, basically, in the backwards pass through the network, what we're going to want to do is compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the inputs of each module. Um, and if we have that, then that kind of goes into part of this minimal API that I was describing, those three methods that if our modules implement those, then we can just plug them together however we like and uh, go ahead and train. The other thing that's um, worth mentioning is interesting is that this idea doesn't just apply to um, things that you might consider to be simple mathematical operations. You can actually apply this to the entire compute graph, including constructs like for loops or conditionals and so on. Um, essentially, we just backtrack through the, the forward execution path. So if something 
has a derivative, we take it, but if, in the case of an if clause, then we essentially, there's multiple execution branches that we could have ended up following. When we work backwards, we just need to remember which branch we follow going forwards, and that's the one that um, we, we use when we're, we're going in the reverse direction. So um, essentially, we can take an entire computer program, more or less, and everything we can apply this automatic differentiation to. And that's one of the powerful things that TensorFlow does for you. It allows you to write these arbitrary compute graphs. And then when it comes time to learn, it does the hard work of um, doing all this backtracking for you and kind of bookkeeping in terms of how the gradients flow. Um, there's a couple of uh, things that you need to be aware of. So um, in most implementations of this, you need to store the variables during the forward pass. So in very big models or sequence models over very long sequence lengths, this can lead to um, us requiring a lot of memory. But there are also clever tricks to get around that. So um, there's a nice paper that I, I link to here, which um, is one way of being memory efficient. And it essentially boils down to being smart about caching um, states in the, in, the, excuse me, in, the, in the forward execution. So rather than remembering everything, you can think of it sort of like every few layers, say we, we checkpoint, and then in the backprop pass, rather than having to remember everything, or the other thing would be to kind of compute everything from scratch, we can find the um, most recent or the, the closest cache state and then just do a little forward uh, computation from that to get the states we need to evaluate the gradients. Um, and yeah, the, m most of this is taken care of automatically um, by things like TensorFlow. And even I think this memory efficient stuff is probably going to find its way into the core TensorFlow code probably in the next release or two. So um, a lot of these things you, on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't need to worry about. But again, I think it's always useful to kind of know what's going on under the hood in case you are doing something unusual or if you are running into some of these problems. OK, so um, in this cartoon here, what, what I'm showing is um, how those different pieces fit together and the sorts of things that it looks like once we're in a more realistic setting. So um, we have vector inputs, vector outputs. <clears throat> and as I said, there's these three API methods um, that as long as we have some sort of implementation of these, then we can plug together these arbitrary graphs of modules and uh, figure out the outputs given inputs, figure out the derivatives we need, figure out the parameter updates. So what are they? <clears throat> the first one is um, what I'm calling the forward pass. So this is just what's the output given the input. Um, so through here. And then there's two um, methods that involve gradients. So one, uh, which I call the backwards pass, is we'd like to know the gradient of the loss with respect to the inputs, given the gradient of the loss with respect to the outputs. Um, and so it turns out that what does that look like? Well, thinking back to the, the chain rule slides from a couple of slides ago, if I, if I want to think about this element-wise, then the gradient of the loss with respect to the ith input is just the sum over all the outputs of the gradient of the loss with respect to each of those outputs, and then the gradient of those outputs with respect to the input. Um, and if we want to use our um, vector matrix notation, then it's the product of this gradient vector with respect to the Jacobian of y. Uh, so this is just um, a kind of compact way of representing things. Um, similarly, um, to get the parameter gradients, well, that's just the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters, um, which is then the sum over all the outputs, the derivative of the loss with respect to those outputs, the derivative of those outputs with respect to parameters. And then um, these are obviously evaluated at the state that it was when we were doing the forward pass. And that, that, that's why I was saying before that we need to keep these states around, because um, typically, these derivative terms will involve um, an expression that involves what the current state is. So um, yeah, these, these are kind of compact ways of representing this. In practice, we, we actually don't, if you were to write these models yourself, you probably wouldn't want to form the full Jacobian in these cases, just because uh, the Jacobians tend to be very sparse. So if there's um, 
th there are many inputs that might not have an influence on an output, and so many elements of the Jacobian are, are often zero. But it's useful notationally, particularly if you kind of go back and forth between this and the subscript notation, if you ever need to kind of derive how to implement uh, an arbitrary new module for yourself, say if you have some weird function that isn't supported by TensorFlow. <coughs> so, yeah, that, that's more or less what I just said. So, we have these um, these methods that we we need to implement, and we chain the forward passes together. So, um, how would we operate this? We'd we'd call the forward method for the linear unit, given the parameters and the input. That would give us some output. The forward method of the ReLU, the forward method of the linear, forward method of, oops, of the softmax, and then we'd get our loss, and then we just call the backwards methods on all these to get our derivatives of uh, outputs with respect to inputs and derivatives with respect to parameters. We <coughs> apply the gradients that we get from the parameters to take a small descent step, and then we just iterate that. So what I'm gonna do in the next couple of slides is go through what some of those operations look like for these building blocks, and by the end of it, we'll have everything we need to do to uh, put together something like um, MNIST classification with cross entropy loss and a single hidden layer. Okay, so the forward pass for a linear module, um, recalling from the beginning of the class, is just given by this expression here. So we, the vector output is a matrix vector operation plus a bias. Um, Again, like I say, in, in these derivations, it's often useful to kind of flip back and forth between um, matrix vector notation and subscript notation. So um, this is just kind of unpacking what the nth element of this output vector is. Um, so we can compose the relevant bits of the Jacobian that we need. So what do we need? We want the, um, the partial of y with respect to its inputs, the partial of y with respect to the bias, and the partial of y with respect to the weights. Um, and um, we get these expressions. This is what I was saying before, so um, this Kronecker delta here. Um, most of the elements of, of this Jacobian are zero because if there isn't, oh, if, if there's not a weight um, involved in this, in, the, in this particular output, if a particular weight isn't involved in producing a particular output, then those elements will be zero, and so it's, it's quite sparse. So armed with this, we can come together and get our backwards pass. So what is that? Um, it's just given by this expression, so we kind of plug in um, these things that we've already derived. So if we have the, as I said, in the, in the backwards pass, we assume that we're given the gradient of the output, with this, the, of the gradient of the loss with respect to the output, and so we just have this matrix vector expression here. Um, similarly, for the parameter gradients, if we kind of churn through this, this math, then we, we get this outer product of the gradient vector with the inputs, and there's a similarly simple thing for the biases. So armed with that, we have everything we need to do forward propagation, backwards propagation, and parameter updates for the linear module. The rally module is, is super simple, so there's no parameters. Um, so that the forward pass is just this um, max of zero in the input, so it's a kind of floor at zero. And then the backwards pass is also simple. Um, it's this kind of element-wise comparison. So if the output was above zero, then the gradient with respect to the inputs is just one. We're in the, the linear pass-through. If the output was below zero, then there are no gradients. Um, the softmax module is um, a little trickier to derive some of the elements for, but it, it's basically still simple calculus. So if we recall what that was, the, the nth output is just this exponent of the um, sum total nth input normalized by that same expression over all units. Um, we can plug these in, derive our Jacobian element, um, and then similarly, we can plug them in the backwards pass. I've actually skipped the derivation for this and I think for the, the next one in the slides just because I think that's gonna come up as something in one of your assignments, but um, in a later version of the slides, I'll update it with the, the, 
the solution in there. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, second. Um, I don't think so. Um, so, were. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Sure, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, good question. Um, I think I usually I usually do it greater than zero. So if it's equal to zero, then I, I treat the gradient as zero. Uh, it's not it's not well defined. In, in practice, you can kind of assume it, it doesn't happen much. But um, uh, I typically would just set the, the define the gradient at zero to be zero. But it, it actually doesn't matter too much um, just because numerically you're extremely unlikely to hit something that's exactly zero. Um, yeah, so um, the final part of this was the, the, the loss, the loss itself. Um, <coughs> and so, again, there's, there's no parameters in the forward pass. We just, this is our definition of the loss. Um, when we take derivatives, we end up with this expression. And you might look at this and be a, a little bit worried, um, particularly that. With, with this kind of expression and x can, can vary a lot, then you might worry that if x is very small, we might run into numerical precision issues. And in fact, actually, that is a, a real concern. So um, what people typically do is um, use this kind of compound module. So it's softmax plus cross entropy. And you, you'll see that in TensorFlow. I think there's um, implementations for both. But um, you know, unless you have your own special reasons, you probably should use the, the um, softmax plus cross entropy, so it basically combines both the, the softmax operation and the cross entropy loss into a, a single operation. Um, and the reason for that is if, if we do that and look at the, the gradients that we get out, then it, it's this much more stable form here. Um, so uh, if we kind of go back, what have we done? We had this graph that we wanted to do learning in, say for digit classification. We've gone through, and for each of these module types, we figured out what we need to do to kind of propagate forwards, what we need to do to propagate backwards, and what we need to do to come up with the um, parameter derivatives. And armed with that, uh, we're ready to go, and we can plug together things in um, whatever order we like. So um, in, in terms of learning, we just kind of iterate through getting an input and a label, running forward propagation, running backwards propagation, getting parameter updates, applying the parameter updates, and cycling. And the nice thing is, if, if we'd you know, written this from scratch ourselves and we wanted to try adding in um, you know, an extra hidden layer, then it, it'd be very simple. We, we, we just kind of put a, another one of these mod modules here, um, change the call sequence, and, and we're good to go. So um, once, once we have those in place, it's then very easy to explore different topologies. If I wanted to kind of you know, come up with some crazy nonlinearity instead of the ReLU, then I'm free to do so. I would just implement a module um, that has those three API methods, and, and everything should just work. In this next section, I'm um, going to kind of do a, a quick tour of what I'm calling a module zoo. So we've seen um, some basic module types that are, are useful, so uh, linear, sigmoid, ReLU, softmax. Um, just going to go through some of the other operations um, that you might see. So there's actually two main types of, of linear module. The first is the kind of simple um, matrix multiplication that we've seen already. Uh, convolution and deconvolutional layers are also linear. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those, but um, Karen's going to cover those in the next lecture on comnets. There's a couple of basic um, sort of like element-wise operations. So addition and uh, point-wise multiplication, some group operations, and then um, a couple of other nonlinearities that are worth knowing about. Um, also, in the slides, I, I link out, um, there's a sort of fairly 
inexhaustible range of possible activation functions you, you'd want to use. Uh, typically, the, the ones that uh, we're going to cover today will will be in the vast majority of things you see, but it's, it's also worth remembering that if you know, if you have a particular problem or if you feel like you need to think creatively about it, you're, you have license to kind of put pretty much anything you want in these models as long as they're differentiable, you're absolutely fine. And even if they're not perfectly differentiable, you might still be able to kind of come up with something that, that's usable. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll go through these relatively quickly. Um, so if we want to do addition, then the the forward prop method, uh, just obviously it's a simple vector addition. Um, the back prop method, also relatively straightforward. Um, there's no parameters, so there's no gradient update. Similarly for multiplication, um, so element-wise multiplication. Um, this kind of thing is, is kind of useful in, as I was saying, in sort of like gating situations where depending on some, um, some context, say, you might want to propagate some parts of the state and not others. Um, also comes up in modulation or things like attention. So if I want to emphasize some parts of my representation relative to others, um, that's somewhere else where you, you'd see this kind of operation. Um, there's a couple of kind of group-wise operations. So um, summing, for instance. Um, so if, if we have a sum, then the gradient just kind of gets distributed. Um, the the backprop gradient gets distributed across all the elements. Uh, if we have a max, so you might see this in max pooling in uh, Comnets, for instance, then basically the, for the back prop, if the element was maximal, then the gradient just passes through. Otherwise, there's no gradient. Um, if we have a switch or a conditional, um, one way of representing it, as I was saying, is with this kind of element-wise multiplication. And we basically just need to remember which branch or which switch was active. Uh, that gets backpropped, everything else gets set to zero. <coughs> um, here's a couple of uh, slight variants on activation functions we've seen already. Um, so the tan h is basically just a kind of scaled and shifted version of the sigmoid. Um, so it's at zero, it's zero, um, and it um, saturates at one and minus one. Um, if you were to build a feedforward network, there's some, in, potentially in some cases, there's advantages to using tan h over sigmoid in that if you initialize with um, small weights and small biases, then you basically get to initialize in this linear region here. And um, in, in practice, it's often nice if you can um, initialize your network so that it, it does a kind of simple, straightforward function rather than kind of risking being in some of these saturated regions where the, the gradients aren't going to flow. Um, for similar kind of gradient flow, reasons, rather than using the ReLU, where this would be kind of zero here, another thing that people sometimes use is to have a very small but non-zero slope in this negative region. And again, it just kind of helps with gradient propagation in that um, you no longer lose all gradients if you're below zero. And that could also can be useful. Um, I'd say that this is actually one of those things where probably if you, it's not a default choice, but maybe it should be in that it's, in, in my experience, it's often better to use this than it is to use a ReLU. That said, I often don't use it just to kind of keep as few moving parts as possible because you know, there are design choices that you, you'd want to make here. So I, if there was something that I really, really cared about getting the best performance out of, I'd probably start to explore some of these variants. But day to day, I tend to kind of stick with the simple choices just because then there's fewer, fewer things to keep track of in terms of mental overhead. Um, we've already seen um, cross entropy loss, and so there's just another simple one. So if we're doing, say, regression problems, then squared error is a, is a common choice. Um, actually, yeah, I, I don't have it on the slides, but I, I can add it later, just because I think it's, again, worth noting. So squared error is, is very common in regression problems. Um, again, in practice, I would probably try squared error if I had this, but I'd, I'd probably also try other norms as well, so uh, in particular L1. Uh, one of the problems with squared error is if you have outliers or, or predictions that for whatever reason have to be way, happen to be way off mark, then you can get extremely large gradients. And so sometimes that can make learning unstable. So again, um, in all these cases, there's sort of like reasonable defaults that are sensible to start with, but it's also useful to know kind of, okay, what would the design choices that I might want to uh, revisit be 
if, if things for whatever reason are not working or if, if gradients are kind of blowing up. Um, and actually that brings me on to uh, this next section where uh, what I'll do is kind of go through some um, sort of high level practical tips in terms of things that might be useful for you when you're dealing with these models um, and kind of good things to, to bear in mind. Um, this came up a bit in the break as well. Um, it's sort of the, the field at the moment, there's definitely a kind of scarcity of, of strong theoretical statements we can make. And so unfortunately that kind of means that a lot of deep learning is still a bit more of a dark art than I think would be ideal. So um, there are some things that you can kind of plug in and just rely on, but there's also a lot of trial and error and um, bits and pieces where you kind of have to do more of a, an interrogative loop of, okay, is this model working? If so, great. If not, okay, what might be going wrong? And um, a lot of getting good at this kind of stuff is refining your intuition for if something isn't working, what might the causes be, how to quickly diagnose that, and also what sort of things you could do to, to fix that. So um, yeah, let's go through these. So one problem that you can run into is overfitting. So you get very good loss on your training set, but um, you don't generalize well. So one thing you can do there, and this was kind of popular in the, the early days, is um, early stopping. So you basically just, rather than training to kind of push your loss all the way to zero, you kind of, um, in parallel, are evaluating on some validation set, and you stop once, say, the, the loss on your validation step starts to go up. Um, that's one method. So, something else you can do, and you, know, you can do all these in combination. Um, there's something else called uh, weight decay, and it basically penalizes um, the weights in, in your network from becoming too big. Um, and one intuition for why this might be helpful is if we think about something like the sigmoid, with small weights, we're going to tend to be in this, um, more often in this linear region. Um, so our kind of functional mapping will be closer to linear, um, and so um, potentially lower complexity. Um, one thing to mention actually about weight decay is that it doesn't have as much an effect on uh, ReLU units as it does on some of these others. So it may be um, a less useful form of regularization for your ReLU layers. It'll still obviously have an effect on the output, but um, with ReLUs, you can kind of you know, scale all the weights um, down and you still have the same set of decision boundaries. So it doesn't quite regularize ReLUs in the same way. Um, something else that you can do, um, is essentially um, add noise, um, and this kind of brings us on to things like dropout. And there's a couple of ways of interpreting what's going on. So um, you, you can add noise to your, your inputs, which you could also think of as a form of data augmentation. You could add noise to your activities. Um, you can add noise to your parameters. You can kind of uh, mask out some of the, the activities of units within layers. And yeah, in terms of the sort of like, what is this doing? Well, you can kind of think of it in a couple of different ways. One is that it prevents the network from um, being too reliant on very uh, precise conjunctions of features. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, that'd be one way to memorize your data set if you kind of have very precise activities that depend on the very precise pattern um, that you see in a particular input. Um, you can also view it as a kind of cheap way of doing ensembling. So if I kind of run the same model multiple times, adding different amounts of noise, then that's somewhat, you might expect that to have somewhat similar effects to if I had an ensemble of similar models. And so you can also kind of tie that into some ideas from uh, sort of Bayesian statistics. So rather than say, have a single model, you have a posterior distribution over parameters and adding noise in a, in a hand wavy sense is, is a little bit like looking at a, a local Laplace approximation. Um, and then probably yeah, the best known of these is, is dropout. And so in this, you sort of randomly set a fraction of activities in a given layer to zero. And at testing time, you kind of need to rescale things by the dropout fraction because at, at test time, you're going to have everything active. So um, the, sort of the um, typical magnitude of the activities in a, in a given layer are going to be higher. Um, it's also worth noting that sort of dropout is one of those things that kind of, you know, 
peaked in popularity, I guess, around like 2012 or so. Uh, it's not used as much these days as it used to be. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is um, the sort of introduction of, of batch normalization. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But another, another factor that can be important in terms of whether your models train well or not is um, how well you initialize them. Um, and yeah, this connects back to what I was saying about you know, the TANH being somewhat nice in that if you have small weights, then you can get to initialize things in a more or less linear region. But at the, at the beginning of training, you want to make sure that um, you have good gradients flowing all the way through your network. So you don't want them to be um, too big, and you don't want them to be too small. Um, there's various heuristics for kind of arranging for this to be the case. Um, I linked to a, a couple of papers here. So, um, and for some reason, a lot of these are kind of named after the first author of the, um, the paper that pr pr uh, proposed these. So there's something that folks call Xavier initialization, um, who, named after Xavier Gloro, who's uh, someone at DeepMind. Um, I forget the, uh, the first name of here, but um, there's a, a follow-on paper. The, the difference between these two is um, they're both trying to say, OK, how should I scale my weights and biases at initialization so that the um, inputs to uh, my nonlinearities, say, have some particular distribution, so uh, maybe zero mean unit variance. Um, the difference between these two is that um, the assumptions that you might want to make if you're using, say, a sigmoid unit are different from those if you're using, say, a rectified linear unit. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of papers here that you might want to take a look at. Um, then there's this thing, batch norm, which um, is used fairly extensively now, particularly in feed-forward networks. Um, it's still not used as much in um, recurrent models, just because there's um, some subtleties about how you'd actually go about doing that. And it's used, I'd say, hardly at all in deep RL. Um, but there's, there's probably modifications to this kind of idea that you could do if you, if you wanted to apply those approaches there. And it, it kind of subsumes some of this stuff in that um, you can think of it as being similar to what we do in some of these initialization methods, but we also um, continuously up update uh, to maintain these properties. So the idea is um, we'd like the, the inputs, uh, the summed inputs to our units to have zero mean and unit variance um, for, for the reasons that I, I described in terms of initialization. What batch norm does is it kind of enforces that, but it also introduces some additional trainable correction factors so that if it turned out that, in fact, I would rather have something that had variance 10 and a mean of 1, then there's kind of scalings and offsets that I can learn during training to help that be the case. But it, um, all that's being equal, it kind of helps keep my activities in a, a reasonable regime with respect to my nonlinearities and also with respect to the kind of gradient scaling that we get when we do backprop. Um, another nice benefit of batch norm that uh, is, I think, actually mentioned less often, but is, is interesting and is perhaps part of the reason why uh, dropout isn't as favored as much, is that you, you get a sort of dropout-like noise effect from batch normalization and that um, in order to enforce um, or to, to encourage these kind of zero mean unit variance properties, you, you look at your local data batch. And so just because of randomization amongst the cases that you get in a given batch, um, from the point of view of any one of those data cases, the contribution to the batch normalization from the rest of the batch members looks a lot like noise. And so that kind of gives you some, um, some sort of regularization effect. Um, anyway, there'll be a, a lot more about this in uh, Corinne's lecture on comnets. Um, another kind of area that's important in practice is how to pick good hyperparameters. So, how do I, you know, how do I know what a good learning rate is? If I'm using dropout, how do I know what fraction of units to drop out, or how much noise to add? If I'm doing weight decay and so on, and um, we're still relatively primitive in how we deal with this. So. Um, Basically, the idea is just to try many combinations and kind of evaluate the final results on some held out data set um, and then pick the best. Um, but there are kind of a couple of kind of practical tricks and subtleties to it. So 
if there's lots and lots of hyperparameters, then the, the search space can be huge. So that's something that you, you might worry about. For a long time, people advocated grid search. So essentially, for each hyperparameter that you you care about, maybe kind of come up with some grid of things to try and kind of systematically try the cross space of all possibilities. Um, turns out that in a lot of cases, that's actually not the best thing to do. And um, there's a nice paper by uh, Bugster and Benjo, which I've linked here, and I've taken this figure from it. And this kind of tries to illustrate why that might be. So depending on what the, the sensitivity of your model is to the hyperparameters, if you do grid search, you could very easily miss these good regions just if your grid happens to be poorly aligned with respect to the regions that are useful. So uh, they advocate and, and kind of empirically demonstrate that this often gives better results just doing random search. So rather than defining a grid for each dimension, you might define some sampling distribution. Um, and then you essentially um, just sa sample from that joint probability space, run, um, run your models. And then a nice thing there is that you, can, you get um, broader coverage of um, any individual um, parameter value. And there's a better chance that you'll find a good region that you can then explore more carefully. So I would say if you're, if you're faced with this kind of issue, then um, unless you have a good reason not to, don't do grid search, but do, do random search. Uh, there's actually kind of a lot of ongoing research in terms of ways to get around some of these problems or at least to kind of automate this search process. So um, there's some approaches from kind of uh, Bayesian modeling uh, where the idea there is if I could somehow um, form a model of how well, form a predictive model of the performance of the models that I'm training, then I could be smarter about figuring out which hyperparameter values to try next. Uh, there's also some um, reinforcement learning approaches, which are essentially um, there's some upfront cost in terms of having to run training many times, but the hope is that um, I can essentially learn how to dynamically adjust these hyperparameters through training so that if I then have another instance of the same sort of learning problem, um, I can be much smarter about how, how I, I treat that. And then there's actually um, a paper that um, I, along with some other folks at DMINE, um, published at Archive at the end of last year, which is this idea of borrowing some tricks from evolutionary optimization and um, a population of simultaneous training models. And essentially the idea there is, instead of doing either grid search or random search, let's say we initialize with random search, we're training everything um, all together, and periodically we look at the training progress that uh, each of the, the jobs in our population has made, and if something seems to be doing particularly poorly, then we look for something that's doing particularly well, we'd copy its parameters over and then do a small adjustment to its hyperparameters and then continue training. And that lets us do, it kind of, it's a nice combination of um, hyperparameter search and a little bit of online model selection in that we're devoting more compute to the models that seem to be doing better and we're also exploring in regions of hyperparameter space that seem to be more promising. Um, it actually has a, another particularly nice benefit in reinforcement learning. So one of the kind of hallmarks of many um, RL problems is that the data distribution that we deal with is, is non-stationary. So, you know, if I'm a robot that's learning to operate in the world, then maybe, you know, the data distribution in this room might be completely different to the, the data distribution when I go into the hallway. And so it could well be the case that throughout learning, the, 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 the hyperparameters that would allow me to make the best learning progress might be quite different. And so um, some of these methods like random search just can't address that, whereas um, the population-based method that we propose is actually kind of locally adaptive, so uh, that's worth looking at. Um, it, it works super well, and um, at DeepMind, we're, we're sort of like using this in the vast majority of our experiments now. The downside is um, it's, it's simple to implement, but it's a little resource-hungry in terms of um, how much compute you're able to access concurrently. So um, if you're able to run, say, 30 or 40 replicas of your uh, experiment in parallel, then um, I, th this is, a, I think, a, a, 
a clearly better way to do high performance search, but yeah, if you don't have sort of Google's resources, then it can be trickier to kind of do that. So you might want to do these more sequential uh, methods. Um, so yeah, here, here's just some kind of rules of thumb. There's, there's a much longer list of this, and like I say, I think it's one of those things that you just kind of build up experience over time, but a couple of kind of easy things to do if you're not getting the performance that you'd hope for. One is to sort of check for dead units. So you could say take a large mini batch and look at the histogram for a given layer, uh, look at the histogram of activities of units in that layer, and what you're looking for is basically you know, some units that maybe never turn on. So for whatever reason, maybe your initialization was off or you went to a weird learning regime, but it might be the case that Say if you have rarely units, many of them are just never in that linear region, and so you have the capacity there, but it's actually not useful for you, and so I'm just getting in the way. Um, a similar diagnostic is um, it can be useful to look at histograms of your gradient, say, again visualized over a large mini batch, and again you're kind of looking out for you know, gradients that are always zero, in which case you're going to have trouble making any progress, or um, you know very heavy tailed gradient distributions, in which case maybe there's some um, data cases that are dominating, or um, there's some kind of numerical issues with your, your gradients blowing up. Um, something else that's a really useful thing to try is um, take a kind of a very small subset of, of data, or if it's an RL setting, if there's a kind of a simplified version of your task, and just try to try a model on that simplified version of the task. And for a small enough subset, you should be able to get. Um, Zero training error, or you know, close to, depending on you know the amount of noise in your label and that kind of stuff. But the idea is, um, if you're not seeing the performance on the real world problem you care about, just as a kind of sanity check, scale back the size of your data set and make sure that you can overfit on a small amount of data. Um, and I guess we've got, just got about ten minutes left. Um, I'll go through this um, fairly quickly. It's a kind of um, research topic, again, from DeepMind that relates to some of the stuff we've talked about, but um, I'll leave five minutes uh, at the end for questions as well. So um, this is some work that was, um, it's from, um, I guess, a, a year and a half ago now, um, although we're kind of, the, this stuff ongoing. And it was this um, idea that we called decoupled neural interfaces using synthetic gradients. And basically the idea is um, rather than, um, <coughs> running, say, our, our forward propagation all the way to the end, and then back propagation all the way at the end, can we, um, say, midway through this chain, predict what the back propagated gradients are going to be before we actually get them? Um, and it turns out that you can do that. Um, you might ask, why, why would I want to? Um, so there's two places, I think, where it's useful. Um, one is if we have is more a kind of, I guess, infrastructure thing. We have massive, massive graphs, and we want to, we need to do lots and lots of computation before uh, we can do an update. Then, um, if this were model parallel, say, then essentially the the, the machines holding this uh, these nodes would be waiting for the backprop pass to happen before they could do an update after the forward pass. So, one way is to kind of allow for potentially better pipelining. The other benefit, and that's partly why I kind of have this um, graph here that's more of a sequence model is um, there are some settings where we actually don't want to have to wait for the future to arrive before we update our parameters. So if I have a sequence model over an extremely long sequence, um, or in the case of an, an RL agent, you know, it's kind of indefinite, I can't sort of, I don't want to wait for an extremely long time before I can run my back prop through time to get gradients. And it might not be, uh, might not be feasible Right now, if what, what people typically do is they'll take a long sequence and they'll chop it into chunks and they'll run something called truncated backprop through time. And if you sit down and think about what that's doing, then it's, it's essentially assuming that outside of the kind of truncation window, the gradients from the future are zero because we're, we're just ignoring them. And so if you look at it like that, the argument behind synthetic gradients is, is kind of obvious. You're basically saying, if, I, if, if my default was to do truncated backprop through time, um, which implicitly makes the assumption that gradients from outside the truncation window are zero. Could I possibly do better by predicting something other than zero? And you know, the answer is probably yes in most cases. And so that's a kind of good motivation for why it's, it's interesting. Um, there's a couple of papers that we've published on this now already, and there's a nice kind of 
interactive blog post that you can you can look at here if you if you want to hear some more. Um, so yeah, that, that's it for today. Um, the next lecture is going to be Comnets with Corinne, but um, yeah, there's uh, time for some questions now, and if there's more questions afterwards, I'm I'm happy to kind of uh, hang around outside for a bit if there's more than we have time for. Yeah, no, that, that, that's yeah, an, another great question. Um, I'd say that's a kind of another ongoing area of research. Um, so um, the sort of default at the moment is more or less, you know, kind of human-driven evolutionary optimization and that, you know, I have some idea in my head of what the kind of fitness of different architectures would be and I kind of prioritize trying those. There's um, some interesting work going on, um, again, using some of these gradient-free methods to um, search over architectures, so uh, at a high level, this idea of if I can start to build a, a predictive model of how different architectures might perform, then I can use that to automate the priority list of, of what I should try next. Um, on the population training side of things, um, some of the stuff that we're working on actually at the moment is um, there are ways of um, adapting network architectures online uh, without having to restart training. So one example of that, um, there's a couple of papers on, on techniques. So there's something called net-to-net -net or net morphism and various other transformations that, um, let's see. So imagine, imagine that I have uh, s some architecture and I'm, I'm thinking, would that architecture be better if I were to uh, interject an additional hidden layer somewhere? Um, I could just start training from scratch, but something else that I can do is take something that, that's been trained originally and figure out a way to inject an additional hidden layer in there that doesn't change the function that's been learned so far. But then after I've kind of added that hidden layer, I can then continue training and potentially allow the model to make use of um, that additional capacity. And sort of one, excuse me, one cartoon of, of how to see how I could do that is um, I could um, say, arrange to have an additional hidden layer with, say, tan H units, um, and initialize them so that they're kind of in the linear region, so it's, it's more or less a linear pass-through. Um, so I could take my previous model, add in an additional layer with the, the existing weight matrix, uh, initialize the outgoing weight matrix of that um, tan H layer to be some kind of large values, and that, that will um, locally give me something that has a very similar functional mapping as the, the network I started out with, but now I have the potential to learn additional connections outgoing from those 10H units. So there's potentially ways of doing this kind of architecture search online, um, and then there's yeah, model-based approaches, and then evolutionary methods. I'd, I'd say they're kind of the three main ways of doing that. Uh, for the evolutionary method you were describing where you're sort of doing live pruning or updates uh -huh. across uh, a range of ongoing learners. Are you looking at kind of a held out set performance, or are you looking at convergence rates? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I've mostly been thinking of this in the context of uh, reinforcement learning, and so there, sort of, um, your test set is your training set in, in a certain sense. Um, yeah, for, for kind of supervised problems, then yeah, looking at it on um, a held out set. Another thing that's worth mentioning, and again, this is something that we're kind of actively working on at the moment, is um, you might not want to make greedy decisions about that. So uh, a good example is, you know, in supervised learning, it might be that, so o often it's good to have a fairly high learning rate initially and then to kind of drop it down. But um, one of the things we, we noticed in applying this to some of the supervised problems is that um, you can, if you kind of look greedily, you can appear to be doing better by dropping that learning rate earlier than you would in, in an optimal setting because it kind of gives you that local boost. And so something that, uh, again, this is appears to be less of a problem in the RL settings we've looked at, but um, something that you probably want to do as we extend these methods is think about kind of performance metrics that aren't just how well am I doing now, but kind of combining in some of that model-based forward-looking thing. So not how well am I doing now, but given everything I've seen about learning progress so far, how well could this run or its descendants end up doing and kind of use um, use a less greedy performance metric 
Well, yeah, if there are no more questions, then uh, thank you. And yeah, um, feel free to um, ask me questions, et cetera.